Good morning, my gritty Vikings. It is Tuesday, the last day of March. Man, this has been a long month. Anyways, let's talk about today. We've got some general announcements, the week two packet we're gonna go over, and Sea of Monsters chapter four. So first of all, announcements today is Superhero Day. I'm wearing my Marvel shirt. And let's see, other announcements. Uh, Zoom, remember on Tuesdays is at nine, Thursdays is at 10. We have, because uh, I'm going to be passing out lunches, so come by, get some lunch, wave hi from a social, safe, social distance. We'll go from there. Uh, let's take a look at the packet, the second half of the packet. First of all, there's some really cool art ideas in here that I would love to see you guys working on. Um, they have uh, just some really cool crayon art lines, drawings. I especially like this one uh, for day three. Uh, I've done this before. It's fun. It's just doodling and you just sort of cut through things and do fun uh, things with shape and color. I think this would be kind of fun. Um, of course, there's still reading, writing, and math in the packet. And remember reading, you can either write it in here or on our Google Classroom, there is a spot for turn-in. You create a document, today I read, today I read, today I read, and turn it in. Uh, let's see. And the writing for this week is an explanatory performance task. It means you're gonna explain about things. And it is about, uh, you are studying archeological discoveries. Um, for this task, you'll be writing an article related to the topic of presenting ancient artifacts or sites to the public. For your article, you will review two sources that provide information about two different finds. Okay, what is your big question here? Um, you need to answer three questions about it. They have source number one about Pompeii, which we've sort of broached the subject of, but not gotten too far. And subject to, we know it, King Cut. And there's pages for explaining, and it kind of takes you through a weird flow map, so you can work through that. Um, but don't and don't forget you have last packets too. I don't know when new packets are coming out, but just to let you know. All right, and that's about it for day six. Uh, but that's for the week. Let's take a look at the math that they have for you guys. Eh, don't drop it. All right. I still dropped it. So first thing, you have something called Ticket Booth. It says a school carnival ticket booth posts the following sign. Ticket booth, one ticket for 50 cents, 12 for $5, 25 for 10, 50 for 25, 120 for 50, have fun. Which amount of tickets offers the best deal and explain? Well, you've got to find the price. It's a rate question. So you've got to find how much is one ticket so if one ticket is 50 cents, 12 tickets are $5. Well, let's see. If one ticket is 50 cents, $12. 12 tickets, well, by following this math, would be $6. Okay, well, nope, they say it's $5, so they're cutting it off. So take a look at each of those and see which is the best deal. How much more... See which one has the highest amount of savings. That's what you're looking for. Um, and go from there. This one. X plus 2 equals 19. Most of you, as soon as I read it, went, I know that answer. Of course you do. It says, use any strategy to solve. So you could draw a picture like the uh, grid, the process grid that we have on the wall. It's still on the wall. Um, draw a picture of it. You know how to do this. And then there's another page of rate and ratio problems. Guacamole. Eli is making guacamole. He uses two tablespoons of cilantro for every three avocados. At this rate, how many tablespoons of cilantro will be needed for nine avocados? Well, let's see. And sorry, I left my eraser in the other room. So he uses two 
for every three, and you want to know if he has nine, how many is he going to need? Well, how much did I go from three to nine? That's how much I'm going to go from two to whatever that is. So draw it out. It'll make sense. That is day six math. All right. So that's about it for that. Um, let's go ahead and take out Sea of Monsters. Let's take a look at chapter four. So yesterday we had some very interesting characters pop up. We had the Gray Sisters. I hope that you took a moment and looked at Google Classroom and researched more on that, like who are the Gray Sisters? Who are Anger, Tempest, and Wasp? But, so we left off Annabeth, Tyson, and Percy are driving up to Half Blood Hill and the camp is under attack, which is really weird because the camp being under attack, something's wrong. So chapter four. Tyson plays with fire. Mythologically speaking, if there's anything I hate worse than a tree of old ladies, it's bulls. Last summer, I fought the Minotaur on top of Half Blood Hill. This time, I saw what I saw up there was even worse. Two bulls. And not just regular bulls. Bronze ones the size of elephants. And even that wasn't bad enough. Naturally, they had to breathe fire, too. As soon as we exited the taxi, the Gray Sisters peeled out, heading back to New York where life was safer. They didn't even wait for their extra three drachma payment. They just left us on the side of the road. Annabeth with nothing but her backpack and knife, Tyson and me still in our burned up tie-dyed gym clothes. Oh man, said Annabeth, looking at the battle raging on the hill. What worried me most weren't the bulls themselves, or the ten heroes in full battle armor that were getting their bronze-plated booties whooped. What worried me was that the bulls were ranging all over the hill, even around the back side of the pine tree. That shouldn't be possible. The camp's magic boundaries didn't allow monsters to cross past Talia's tree, but the metal bulls were doing it anyway. One of the heroes shouted, Border Patrol, to me! A girl's voice, gruff and familiar. Border Patrol? I thought the camp didn't have a Border Patrol. It's Clarice, Annabeth said. Come on, we have to help her. Normally, rushing to Clarice's aid would not have been high on my to-do list. She was one of the biggest bullies at camp. The first time we met, she tried to introduce me to my head to a toilet. She's also the daughter of Ares, and I'd had a very serious disagreement with her father last summer, so now the god of war and all his children basically hated my guts. Still, she was in trouble. Her fellow warriors were scattering, running in panic as the bulls charged. The grass was burning in huge swatches around the pine tree. One hero screamed and waved his arms as he ran in circles, the horsehair plume on his helmet blazing like a fiery mohawk. Clarice's own armor was charred. She was fighting with a broken spear shaft, the other end embedded uselessly in the metal joint of one bull's shoulder. I uncapped my ballpoint pen. It shimmered, growing longer and heavier until I held the bronze sword riptide in my hands. Tyson, stay here. I don't want you taking any more chances. No, Annabeth said, we need him. I stared at her. He's mortal. He got lucky with the dodgeballs, but he can't. Percy, do you know what those are up there? The cold cheese bulls made by Hephaestus himself. We can't fight them without Medusa sunscreen SPF 50,000. We'll get burned to a crisp. Medea's what? Annabeth rummaging through her backpack and cursed. I had a jar of tropical coconut scent sitting on my nightstand at home. Why didn't I bring it? I learned long ago not to question Annabeth too much. It just made me more confused. Look, I don't know what you're talking about, but I'm not going to let Tyson get fright. Percy, Tyson, stay back. I raised my sword. I'm going in. Tyson tried to protest, but I was already running up the hill towards Clarice, who was yelling at her patrol, trying to get them into a... Uh, Phalanx, phalanx, flanks, flanks, formation. It was a good idea. The few who were listening lined up shoulder to shoulder, locking their shields to form an ox hide and bronze wall, their spears bristling over the top like porcupine quills. Unfortunately, Clarice could only muster six campers. The other four were still running around with their helmets on fire. Annabeth ran towards them, trying to help. She taunted one of the bulls into chasing her, then turned invisible, completely confusing the monster. The other bull charged Clarice's line. I was halfway up the hill, not close enough to help. Clarice hadn't even seen me yet. The bull moved deadly fast for something so big. 
Its metal hide gleamed in the sun. It had fist-sized rubies for eyes and horns of polished silver. When it opened its hinged mouth, a column of white-hot flame blasted out. Hold the line, Clarice ordered her warriors. Whatever else you could say about Clarice, she is brave. She was a big girl with cruel eyes like her father's. She looked like she was born to wear Greek battle armor, but I didn't see even how she could stand against the bull's charge. Unfortunately, at that moment, the other bull lost interest in finding Annabeth. It turned, wheeling around behind Clarice on her unprotected side. Behind you, I yelled, look out. I shouldn't have said anything because all I did was startle her. Bull number one crashed into her shield and the flanks broke. Clarice went flying backwards and landed in a smoldering patch of grass. The bull charged past her, but not before blasting the other heroes with its fiery breath. Their shields melted right off their arms. They dropped their weapons and ran as bull number two closed in on Clarice for the kill. I lunged forward and grabbed Clarice by the straps of her armor. I dragged her out of the way just as bull number two freight train passed. I gave it a good swipe with Riptide and cut a huge gash in its flank, but the monster just creaked and groaned and kept on going. It hadn't touched me, but I could feel the heat of its metal skin. Its body temperature could not could have microwaved a frozen burrito. Let me go, Clarice pummeled my hand. Percy, curse you. I dropped her in a heap next to the pine tree and turned to face the bulls. We were on the inside slope of the hill now, the valley of Camp Half-Blood Hill, Camp Half-Blood directly below us, the cabins, the training facilities, the big house, all of it at risk if these bulls got past. Annabeth shouted orders to the other heroes, telling them to spread out and keep the bulls distracted. Bull number one ran a wide arc, making its way back towards me. As it passed the middle of the hill, where the invisible boundary line should have kept it out, it slowed down a little as if struggling against a strong wind, but then it broke through and kept coming. Bull number two turned to face me, fire sputtering from the gash I'd cut in its side. I couldn't tell if it felt any pain, but its ruby eyes seemed to glare at me like it had just made things personal. I couldn't fight both bulls at the same time. I'd have to take down bull number two, two first, cut off its head before bull number one charged back into the range. My arms already felt tired. I realized how long it had been since I worked out with Riptide and how out of practice I was. I lunged, but bull number two blew flames at me. I rolled aside as the air turned to pure heat. All the oxygen was sucked out of my lungs. My foot caught on something, a tree root maybe? And the pain shot up my ankle. Still, I managed to slash with my sword and lop off part of the monster's snout. It galloped away wild and disoriented. But before I could feel too good about that, I tried to stand and my left leg buckled underneath me. My ankle was sprained, maybe broken. Bull number one charged straight towards me. No way I could crawl out of its path. Annabeth shouted, Tyson, help him. Somewhere near towards the crest of the hill, Tyson wailed, can't get through. I, Annabeth Chase, give you permission to enter camp. Thunder shook the hillside. Suddenly Tyson was there barreling towards me yelling, Percy needs help. Before I could tell him no, he dove between me and the bull just as it unleashed a nuclear firestorm. Tyson, I yelled. The blast swirled around him like a red tornado. I could only see the black silhouette of his body. I knew with horrible certainty that my friend had just been turned into a column of ashes. But when the dust, when the fire died, Tyson was still standing there, completely unharmed. Not even his grungy clothes were, were scorched. The bull must have been surprised as I was because before it could unleash a second blast, Tyson balled up his fists and slammed him into the bull's face. Bad cow! His fist made a crater where the bull's bronze bull's snout used to be. Two small columns of flame shot out its ears. Tyson hit it again, and the bronze crumpled under his hands like aluminum foil. The bull's face now looked like a sock puppet pulled inside out. Down, Tyson yelled. The bull staggered and fell back on its legs. Its legs moved feebly in the air, steam coming out of its ruined head in odd places. Annabeth ran over to check on me. My ankle felt like it was filled with acid, but she gave me some Olympian nectar to drink from her canteen, and I immediately started to feel better. There was a burning smell that I later learned was me. My hair on my arms had been completely singed off. The other bull, I asked. Annabeth pointed down the hill. 
Clarice had taken care of bad cow number two. She impaled it through the back leg with her celestial bronze spear. Now, with its snout half gone and a huge gash in its side, it was trying to run in slow motion, going in circles like some kind of merry-go-round animal. Clarice pulled off her helmet and marched towards us. A strand of her stringing brown hair was smoldering, but she didn't seem to notice. You ruin everything, she yelled at me. I had it under control. <coughs> I was too stunned to answer. Annabeth grumbled. Good to see you too, Clarice. Ah! Clarice screamed. Don't ever, ever try to save me again. Clarice, Annabeth said, you've got wounded campers. That sobered her up. Even Clarice cared about her soldiers under her command. I'll be back. She growled and trudged off to assess the damage. I stared at Tyson. You didn't die. Tyson looked down like he was embarrassed. I am sorry. Came to help. Disobeyed you. My fault, Annabeth said. I had no choice. I had to let Tyson cross the boundary line to save you. Otherwise, you would have died. Let him cross the boundary line, I asked. But, Percy, have you ever looked at Tyson closely? I mean, in the face, ignore the mist, and really look at him? The mist makes humans see only what their brains can process. I know it can fool demigods too, but I looked at Tyson in the face. It wasn't easy. I had always had trouble looking directly at him, though I never quite understood why. I thought it was just because he always had peanut butter on his crooked teeth, and I forced myself to focus on his lumpy nose and then a little higher at his eyes. No, not eyes. One eye. One large calf brown eye right in the middle of his forehead with thick lashes and big tears trickling down his cheeks on either side. Tyson, I stammered, you're a cyclops. Annabeth offered, a baby by the looks of him. Probably why he couldn't get past the boundary line as easily as the bulls. Tyson's one of the homeless orphans. One of the what? They're almost in all the big cities, Annabeth said distastefully. They're mistakes, Percy. Children of nature, spirits, and gods, well, one god in particular usually, and they don't always come out right. No one wants them. They get tossed aside. They grow up wild on the streets. I don't know how this one found you, but he obviously likes you. We should take him to Chiron and let him decide what to do. But the fire, how? He's a cyclops, Annabeth paused, as if she remembers something unpleasant. They work in the forges of the gods. They have to be immune to fire. That's what I was trying to tell you. I was completely shocked. How had I never realized what Tyson was? But I didn't have much time to think about it just then. The whole side of the hill was burning. Wounded heroes needed attention, and there were still two banged-up bronze bulls to dispose of, which I didn't figure would fit into one recycling bin. Clarice came back over and wiped the soot off her forehead. Jackson, if you can stand up, get up. We need to carry the wounded back to the big house. Let Tantalus know what happened. Tantalus? I asked. The activities director. Chiron's the activities director, and where's Argus? He's head of security. He should be here. Clarice made a sour face. Argus got fired. You two have been gone too long. Things are changing. But Chiron, he's trained kids to fight monsters for over 3,000 years. He can't just be gone. What happened? That happened, Clarice snapped. She pointed to Talia's tree. Every camper knew the story behind the tree. Six years ago, Grover Annabeth and two other demigods named Talia and Luke had come to Camp Half-Blood, chased by an army of monsters. When they got cornered on top of this hill, Talia, the daughter of Zeus, had made her last stand here to give her friends time to reach safety. As she was dying, her father Zeus took pity on her and changed her into a pine tree. Her spirit had reinforced the magic borders of the camp, protecting it from monsters. The pine had been here ever since, strong and healthy. But now its needles were yellow. A huge pile of dead ones littered the base of the tree. In the center of the trunk, three feet from the ground, was a puncture mark the size of a bullet hole, oozing green sap. A sliver of ice ran through my chest. Now I understood why the camp was in danger. The mythological borders were failing because Talia's tree was dying. Someone had poisoned it. Dun, dun, dun. All right. So one of the things we need to discuss is who is Tantalus? Hmm. I will try to find something and put it on Google Classroom for you all. But that's it for today. Hope to see you at lunch. And that's where I'll be for the next two days. Uh, that's about it.
keep reading, keep working. Peace out.